Welcome back to What's the Juice podcast. We have such a beautiful episode today with Sandra Sharp. She's a certified functional nutrition practitioner and health coach based in Dubai. And after a wild journey with her own fertility and being diagnosed with stage one thyroid cancer directly after giving birth during the pandemic, she really turned her immense pain and struggle into this beautiful passion for helping other women, not only with their physical fertility, but also with the emotional, mental, and spiritual aspects of feeling safe in their body, of communicating their needs throughout their pregnancy and postpartum, and truly setting themselves up for success for this massive life and identity shift that happens when you become a mother. She is the true definition of a practitioner who provides comprehensive, holistic, mind, body, spirit, fertility, and postpartum support. And we get into every single facet of pregnancy and motherhood today on a soul level. She talks a lot about her journey being diagnosed with cancer and how that created so much fear and stress in her body and how her way out through that was actually just connection, sharing her pain and sharing her story with other women, learning how to ask for help and reach out for support and leave behind the perfectionist, I can do it all myself mindset and how that completely improved her health on so many different levels as she went into remission from cancer. We talk about how you can prepare yourself for pregnancy, not only physically, but emotionally with your partner and why instead of decorating a nursery before giving birth, it's probably a better idea to have really <laughs> difficult and specific conversations about managing expectations and how your values are gonna change with people like your partner and your friends. She talks a lot about the root causes of fertility struggles in women and how so often what she's seeing in her clients is this pattern of under eating. And we essentially say that because of diet culture in the 90s, we're now seeing this rebound effect three decades later of women who are chronically undernourished and still in this mindset of kind of subconsciously or secretly always being on a diet because that's just the way we were taught to function and taught to manage our bodies and how getting past that roadblock is such a big piece of the fertility journey and how switching to a mindset of nourishment is so important. And we also talk about the tradition of the first 40 days or the quarantine postpartum and how Sandra kind of had her own experience with this based on her Middle Eastern heritage and the specific foods and herbs and practices that are included in the first 40 days within traditional Middle Eastern culture. I love learning about different versions of quarantine from ancient cultures and medicine systems around the world. So it was really nice to hear about the herbs and spices and traditional elixirs that are used in her corner of the world and in her culture. I just thought it was such a beautiful conversation. It went in directions I didn't expect. We talked a lot about relationships and communicating your needs and just being witnessed by other people when you're struggling. And it's one of those episodes that you think is gonna go the science route, but ends up really speaking to your soul. So I loved it. I hope you guys love it. For any mamas out there or mamas to be, this one is for you and I'll see you next week. Okay, are you ready? You know, we feel each other's emotions. It's everything. It's living my life intentionally. That's the message, right? Absolutely. There's no difference between our mental health and our physical health. It's the same exact thing. And without further ado, let's get juicy. Welcome to the podcast, Sandra. Thank you so much for having me. This is um, such an honor to be here. I've listened to your podcast for years, so... Uh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. I think that's the coolest part is when practitioners from our actual community who've been a part of What's the Juice and OO for so long now get to come on the show and teach and contribute and collaborate. It's just such a special feeling. And I can't wait for you to share your story and your clinical wisdom. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So First, I want to just open up. You are a holistic practitioner. You're a certified functional nutrition practitioner. You're a health coach, and you essentially specialize in hormone health. And what it seems like to me is more and more you're you're taking this special interest in fertility and postpartum and all of that, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And 
I would love to know what got you so passionate about specializing in this and why do you see this as what you've called a global fertility crisis? What got me so passionate, I would say, is a bit of my own personal experience coupled with you know, what I was helping with women do the most in my practice for the last several years, which was one, getting many of them pregnant and also helping them learn how to truly nourish their bodies and break free from this like harmful diet culture, which, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk and we'll get into later on, but also to listen to their intuition, their inner wisdom, and really start to embrace their feminine energy, their divine feminine energy, which I think we've like strayed so far from um, as women. And we're just stuck in this like masculine space of do, do, do and protocols and achieving things. And we've kind of forgotten how to live in our feminine. And I think that, you know, I, I saw that in my practice that women are really forgetting those things, how to nourish their bodies, how to, um, you know, live in their feminine. And so it was kind of like a, this whole sort of experience combined with my personal experience, you know, how little I knew about pregnancy, how little I knew about giving birth to a baby, um, how little I knew about becoming a mother, which is like this whole world um, that was just like completely blew me away. And I also saw the like firsthand the limitations of conventional care when it comes to supporting women through this journey. Um, and unless you were good at advocating for yourself, which a lot of women unfortunately aren't um, in the health and medical space, you know, the majority of the women aren't getting the support that they need, whether it's from a preconception phase or during pregnancy um, or even more so during postpartum. Um, and yeah, I mean, the whole experience of pregnancy and uh, motherhood really broke me open, <laughs> both literally and phys figuratively. Um, you know, you, you have this whole new body, you become a whole new person. And this was a profoundly transformative experience. Um, and I don't think people talk enough about the magnitude of becoming a parent, a mother specifically, and how it completely changes you from the inside out. So it was like a combination of all of these things. And I started to see that what I was doing in my practice was really helping women with their overall hormonal health, but it was also helping them get pregnant, which is what they wanted. So I kind of, from, you know, just this passion that kind of grew between my clinical practice and my personal experience, I kind of niched down into the fertility space and I absolutely love it. I think it's um, such a special niche and one that definitely needs a lot of attention. Um, and, you know, we are in a global fertility crisis, unfortunately. So one in six people are struggling with fertility currently, and that number is forecasted to increase over the next eight years. So we are really at this sort of turning point of, okay, well, where do we go on from here? And with something being so natural, like pregnancy, why are people struggling so much? So that is really the sort of the inspiration behind why I came into this space. I want to ask you in just a moment, why are people struggling so much? I want to get your clinical pearls with what you've seen personally and patterns that you've noticed. I think that clinicians pattern recognition is so important. You guys are on the front lines where we're getting our data, but at the same time, I just want to echo back sort of what you said, because you know, you ended it with, I've niched down into like the fertility space and helping people get pregnant. But you said so much more than just that. You really talked about walking women into kind of this initiation into a new identity, a new phase of their lives. You use the terms feminine energy. And I think, um, I think that nowadays with social media, there's now become a whole like feminine masculine coaching space. And like, it, it has also become commodified and kind of twisted into something it's not. Even when you mentioned protocols, I thought that was really interesting. You're like, we're in the masculine space and we're like, oh, I just need another protocol. I just need to like stick to my supplements and my exercise better. I need to be better. When often, when your body is in a space of not feeling safe, you actually need to slow down or maybe journal or maybe do things that are not rigid and protocol based and based on the um, paradigm that something about your body is wrong. And it seems like that's also kind of like that mind, body, spirit piece that you're diving into and that you're seeing with people. And I really appreciate that because 
I feel like that's always what OO has been about is I'm not just doing things for people's bodies. It's we want to provide resources well beyond that. So just want to like say that so that we can sprinkle that throughout this conversation. And with that being said, what are you finding clinically are the most pressing roadblocks in terms of fertility for the population that you're seeing? So it definitely goes back to what you've just mentioned. Um, and also what I, what I, you know, spoke about before. So like I said, pregnancy is a natural process, right? Your body as a woman is primed for reproduction. So I think the first thing is when we start to see that your body is not functioning the way that it's meant to, we have to ask the question why. And I think that is the first roadblock is not asking the question why we don't have this curiosity about our bodies and we aren't sort of guided in that way anyways, because obviously conventional medicine just ends the investigation, you know, once you've reached a certain um, age or once you've, you know, miscarried several times and they don't understand why, then the investigation ends. But you we really need to understand why. And this is one of the things that I'm seeing more and more is that women are not asking why and they're not also get, and when they do ask why, they're not getting the right answers or they're not getting any answers. Um, and a lot of the women that come into my practice are women who have gone through multiple miscarriages and they're just told that they have unexplained infertility um, or that they need to do IVF because it's a guarantee for pregnancy, which is again, misinformation. And these are young women in their thirties who are like I said, not getting the answers that they deserve to why their bodies are not functioning the way that they're meant to. And so we have to, as practitioners, become the detective for them, you know, and that's really what I do in my practice is I become this sort of detective and connecting the dots and putting the puzzle pieces together. And um, one of the sort of biggest things that I'm seeing is actually, well, two things. One, again, we're going to be talking a lot about this, is the fact that women are massively under eating. They're massively undernourishing their bodies. Um, and it is actually shocking because one of the most common things that I hear in my practice is, but I eat healthy. And so when you ask them, what does your healthy look like? It's shocking. Um, and it's unfortunate that they think that that's healthy for their bodies. So they're massively under eating, they're nutrient deficient, um, so that's one of the biggest things. The next biggest thing, um, and again, we're going to, you know, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit more, is that the mental and emotional piece is one of the biggest things that I see shift the needle in, in getting pregnant. And it's just super surprising how that actually comes into play, because a lot of the times we're focused on the physical aspects of why your body is not functioning the way it's meant to, whether it's, you know, your nutrition or your lifestyle or what you're doing on a day to day basis, your your overall health. But nobody really asks women like, how are you actually doing? You know, how, how are you feeling? You know, you've just been through three miscarriages. Are you OK? Um, what are your fears? What are you thinking about? And it's really unfortunate to see that just that question alone prompts so much emotion and trapped mental and emotional, like these blockages that are just waiting to come out, but they don't know where to express that. And that even happened to me personally um, between my pregnancies and, and we can get into that, but that is something that I see very often um, as a roadblock is these mental and emotional, um, you know, fears and and uh, thoughts and the fact that women are actually not ready to have a baby. They're not ready for pregnancy um, in many different ways. So I think those two are, are the, the sort of the biggest things. Um, and of course, the fact that no one's playing detective for them. No one is asking them these questions. No one is understanding what their day to day looks like. No one's understanding what their traumas are, what their struggles are, what, you know, um, what their relationships are like, what their partner's health is like, you know? So these are all things that are so important. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you like a really basic example of one of the most common things I see in my practice. So I had a client actually who came to me um, several years ago. She was in her early 30s and she had gone through multiple miscarriages and an ectopic pregnancy. So for anyone who doesn't know what an ectopic pregnancy is, it's basically 
when the fertilized egg implants outside of the uterus or the, or the womb. And it's usually in the fallopian tubes. So she had an emergency laparoscopy and she removed a fallopian tube. And she came to me desperate. And she was told that she basically had under, unexplained fertility and infertility, sorry, and that she had to go through IVF. And that was her only hope. Um, this woman also had terrible headaches. She had debilitating fatigue. She had hair loss. She was cranky. She was irritable. Um, and her TSH level, her thyroid stimulating hormone kept elevating and her doctor had no idea why, you know, and they never asked to like maybe further investigate what her thyroid health was like. So when she came into, to work with me, I was like, the first thing we have to do is look at your testing. Like we need to get your thyroid properly tested. And, um, sure enough, it came back with Hashimoto's. And she was not only, not only did she have Hashimoto's and her antibodies were through the roof, she also had hypothyroidism. Um, and so we went through several different things. Um, we discovered that she, again, was massively under eating. Um, you know, I made sure that she started eating three to four meals a day, that she was balancing her blood sugar. Um, you know, she upped her carbs, which really helped with her moods um, and her energy. And in literally two weeks, I'm not joking, she was like a different person. And we supported her thyroid. Um, we did a lot of supplementation like selenium, magnesium, vitamin D, which she was very deficient in. Um, again, she was told she was in the normal range, uh, which she wasn't, not the optimal range uh, anyways. And we got her on a prenatal. And then we did a lot of like stress management. So a lot of perspective shifts. She had a very unhealthy relationship with food. She was part of, you know, the vicious cycle of this diet culture. She was, um, you know, scared of carbs. She was scared of too much protein because she didn't want to bulk, you know, and all of these conversations, I was like, we have to move away from that. Like you want to bring safety into your body. And that's why your body is not, it's able to get pregnant but it's unable to keep that pregnancy. Um, and after doing all of that stuff, she was an amazing client to work with. And within four months, she was pregnant. Um, she currently has a beautiful, healthy baby girl. She had a very healthy pregnancy. She had a very healthy and balanced postpartum. And she messaged me actually uh, a few weeks ago and she sent me pictures of her daughter and she said, you know, I just want to say I had the most amazing postpartum period because of the work that we did. I just, you know, everything sort of transfers into the next stage. As long as you've built that foundation and you've had someone to support you, it truly changes the woman. And so that is a very typical uh, sort of case that I see in my practice. I definitely want to know how you strategically supported her into that postpartum phase. And what about your support and your guidance and tips and maybe even just you holding space made her feel so equipped for that phase. But I want to also just kind of share a reaction to that story because my my wheels are turning as I'm hearing this. And, you know, you mentioned earlier these mental and emotional kind of like mindset roadblocks and this stress and like this emotional piece of pregnancy. And I always you know, the, the farther I've grown into my podcast conversational career, I like to play devil's advocate in my head sometimes when someone is presenting a theory. And I think about where I grew up. I grew up in Yonkers, New York. It's right outside the Bronx. And a lot of folks that I grew up with were in pretty difficult situations, right? Like low income neighborhoods, really stressful neighborhoods, stressful lives. And they did not have any trouble getting pregnant. Like I have a lot of folks that I grew up with who got pregnant multiple times. Maybe it's because they often had babies young. So their, their stores and nutrient reserves were better, but I'm like, these are some of the most stressed individuals on earth who are going through severe trauma and not feeling safe in their neighborhoods and in their lives and financially and all these things. And they have a lot of intergenerational trauma, but they're not having trouble getting pregnant. But then you switch it over and, and not to discount that mental and emotional piece. I think that is important, but sometimes I'm amazed at how people can override that and overcome. But then you bring it to the under eating piece. And I'm like, that is one thing that I can absolutely see because often those folks are not necessarily under eating calorie or carb wise, right? Like they're, they're well nourished in that 
caloric sense. So that makes so much sense to me that a lot of like the fertility crisis that we're seeing is almost like this pendulum swing from the diet culture of the 90s. And it's like, how did we not think that three decades later, we wouldn't see this explosion of infertility from the the ripple effect of that because we were trained to chronically under eat and think that that is totally normal and always subconsciously revert to that. It's like that perpetual diet that women are on even without realizing it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And, um, and I mean, you said it like we, we're starting to see the effects of all of these things. Um, now, you know, our generation is starting to see the impact of what we did in the nineties, you know, women who have been on birth control, even for like 20 years, you know, they're really struggling to get pregnant. Now they're struggling with their hormones. They're, you know, so there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of things that we were sort of programmed into believing. And it's, it's really a lot of unlearning what we were conditioned into. And I think that is probably one of the hardest pieces of any of the work that I do, whether that's, you know, in the hormone health space in general or in the fertility space. Um, And just going back to your point about, I mean, this is something that women ask me all the time who are frustrated that they're not getting pregnant. And they're like, but my friend drinks three times a week and she got pregnant in like a month. Um, So, Again, I mean, there's, there's a lot of discussions around that. Um, and I think one of the things, and this is something that I go into my programs about with my clients is like, what are the things that are actually potentially stopping you from getting pregnant outside of the nutrition, outside of the gut health, outside of all that scientific stuff. And a lot of the times these women are perfectionists. They're overachievers. They're people pleasers. They've lost intuition with their bodies. Um, so there's that whole piece as well of like these women who have like a to-do list of wanting to get pregnant. I need to get pregnant yesterday. I, you know, have this one, two, three protocol that I need to um, follow, which yes, I always talk about being proactive in the fertility space, you know, preconception nutrition and preparing our bodies is so important, but we also don't want to make it a chore, right? Um, We don't want it to be something else on our to-do list, right? You still need to live your life and find joy and be happy and, you know, go about your day to some in some sense. But of course, keeping in mind that you want to take care of your overall health. Um, So I think there's a very fine line between like what we need to do to prepare our bodies for pregnancy, but also not forgetting that this is not just a list of things that we need to do once again, you know, again, living in that masculine energy and um, breaking away from this like control. There is a certain sense of surrender in this whole process of like, there is divine timing in this whole process that we also need to take into consideration. So um, yeah, I think it's a combination of all of those things. If that kind of makes sense, I kind of went on a tangent, but I I hope that kind of encompasses um, the point that you were making. Yeah. I think that it's an excellent point and that it's almost touching on this piece of, like you said, perfectionism, control, almost obsession. Uh, It can be borderline obsession around, I need this to happen because the scenarios that I'm referring to were, like you said, you know, growing up with a lot of folks who were smoking weed from a young age, smoking weed and drinking actively while they accidentally got pregnant. It's like, you look at populations like that and, you know, like friends of mine who, we're like, yeah, I didn't mean to get pregnant. And I was like partying and I was living my life and it just happened. And then you look at populations of women in the wellness world who often have a lot more access and a lot more resources and can spend all the money and do all the right thing and see all the practitioners. And it's interesting how that is often the population who's having trouble conceiving. And so maybe there is this, um, this factor of that, like control and obsession and especially under eating. I think it like really that is the one huge parallel I can make that is contributing to this picture of just an underfueled body, like you said, that can't sustain a pregnancy. So I think that's so important to hear. And I, I think that that is probably the most helpful takeaway for women is advice around reframing the, the fear of food into this increase in nutrient stores and nourishment um, in order to shift the body into this like safe place that could even accidentally get pregnant, you know? 
Yeah, definitely. Exactly. And also, the, the sorry, just to add one more thing is like the question of, you know, those people that got pregnant, they got, they have healthy baby, they have a baby, but are they healthy babies? You know, we also need to think about that. Um, and that's often, you know, I have lots of discussions with women who are like, but I want to get pregnant now. And I'm like, okay, but if you, if you think about your life right now, your state of health right now, and you bring a baby into this equation, it, are you actually ready for that in terms of like, how healthy is this baby going to be? Are you going to be preventing potential complications? Um, so we also need to think like, is it just about having a baby or is it also about having more importantly, a healthy baby? So, um, you know, that's where again, the preparation comes into play. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a great point. <laughs> I no, think- I, I love this. I love the nuance and throwing around the scenarios of, yeah, but, but why can certain people get pregnant so easily or accidentally? And then these people can't, and then you're coming back with, well, think about also the health of those babies and really kind of like planning for that and giving those babies the best possible outcome. I think that's, that's a really good, I, I love this. I love a little devil's advocate back and forth and kind of like positing scenarios because I think as people listen to a podcast like this, those thoughts come up of like, but what about this? And why is this happening? And that makes sense that um, we're also not thinking about giving those children the best possible epigenetic outcome and the best possible nutrient stores preventing even like things like midline defects, for example, um, and things like tongue ties or whatever it is by making sure that they have enough B vitamin and folate stores, you know? So There's so many things where we can optimize as well. And I think that's a really important area to be informed in. So yeah, exactly. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, that background and letting me um, think about the big picture there. (laughs) So the last question I want to ask about your clinical experience before we get into more of the under eating diet culture and helping women to reframe that mindset is is there anything that's completely taken you by surprise as a practitioner? Any particular case studies that you can think of similar to the Hashimoto's one where you were like, wow, this was the thing for this couple or for this woman. And I did not expect that. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, I, I, it kind of goes back to what I mentioned before is the emotional mental blockages. Um, I see this all the time and it's really surprising because, and, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll kind of weigh in on my experience as well, because I had that experience of, you know, doing all the right things, but my headspace was not in the right place. And um, as a result, I miscarried. And I'll go into the details of that. But what is surprising is that, you know, a lot of people are doing all these right things, but their mental and emotional resilience is not there, is not ready yet for a pregnancy. Um, And What's surprising is a lot of the women who are actually telling me that they are wanting a baby, when you kind of ask them more questions into their mental health, their traumas, their insecurities, their relationship with their bodies, their relationship with their partners, um, they are not ready. Um, And they think that somehow once they get pregnant, all of this is just going to get better. Um, but it's the complete opposite. You know, pregnancy and motherhood, they literally amplify these problems. So women fantasize about the idea of having a baby, but if you're not healing this stuff now, that transfers into motherhood. It transfers into postpartum. It transfers to your child when you are, you know, dealing with a toddler and um, they're triggering all of these things inside of you that because you didn't do that inner child work and you didn't heal those things and you didn't heal those insecurities. And with pregnancy and motherhood and postpartum, you are literally a different person. Like not only are you physically a different person, your body's changed, your hormones have changed, your you know, um, your values and your priorities have changed. You literally become a new person. Your brain changes, right? So we need to make sure that we are paying enough attention to that preconception. And um, I've had many cases of women who came to me who are like, I literally am doing all the right things. 
Um, but then you ask them, okay, well, you know, again, like I said, what are, what are all the sort of the mental and emotional blockages that you think you have? And they have all sorts of things. Um, and when we actually healed those things, they got pregnant. And so, I mean, I, I even remember, um, there was one story of a client who, got, uh, so she had again, multiple miscarriages and she was a generally very healthy woman. Um, she was in her mid thirties and this was her first pregnancy. And, um, she came to me and she was like, I honestly don't know what to do. Um, but she had a really terrible relationship with her mother. Um, and she had all these fears about becoming a mother. And so, when we worked through that and she also got support, she did a lot of like Reiki healing and therapy and all of these kinds of things. She got pregnant within six months. And so we cannot ignore that piece to the puzzle because it can be that literal thing that pushes the needle when you are someone who is quote unquote doing all the right things. Um, and even in my own personal experience between pregnancies, I mean, I, I was ready to have a baby or, or so I thought, but I actually, um, was dealing with a lot of postpartum trauma, um, from my first pregnancy. And, um, just to kind of go into some of the details. So I got pregnant, um, in 2019, I delivered my first baby, uh, February 2020. So she was born literally a month before lockdown. And not only did I have a very traumatic birth experience, which was like completely eye-opening and not at all what I expected, but a month later, we weren't allowed to see anyone. We weren't allowed to go anywhere. Um, and I was just, it was honestly the most, the most lonely, depressed I've ever felt because I had no idea how to navigate any of this. And then obviously on top of that, you've got the fear and anxiety of the pandemic. Um, so six months postpartum, I actually also found out I was diagnosed with thyroid uh, cancer. So stage one thyroid cancer. And that again was like a complete shock to my system. So as you can imagine, you know, postpartum was this horrific, traumatic, lonely, depressive period of my life. And so when I was ready for the next baby, in the back of my mind, I was like, well, what if it happens again? And that fear of like, well, what if I get cancer again? What if we, you know, something happens and I'm alone again? Um, what if, you know, the postpartum period is the same? And I was doing all the right things. I was literally, you know, even more than my first pregnancy but that one mental and emotional block caused me to miscarry. And I truly believe that, that it was that. Um, because as soon as I worked on that, within three to four months, I was pregnant again. And now, you know, I have uh, my second baby. So we really cannot ignore that piece. And I think that has been the most surprising thing. And this is why it's something that I pay so much attention to in my programs, because I don't see anyone else talking about this enough, nearly enough. Um, and I think like, you know, it, like I said, it's really one of those things that pushes the needle for a lot of women. Yeah. Wow. I mean, thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. Not just the, I mean, the isolation then combined with the fear of being diagnosed with cancer and having a new baby that's totally dependent on you. I can't imagine how many different things are running through your mind and we know, you know, there's, there's science now to explain how that psychological stress can translate to levels of inflammatory cytokines and different inflammatory mediators in the body and how much fear and stress and anxiety and the opposite, right? Social support, being close to people, having that connection can even fight some of that inflammation. So the fact that you had to go through that without the social connection that is really an insane thing that you had to experience. And I hate that for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm it was so not sorry. A great time of my life. Yeah. But, but at the same time, it's, it. it's incredible that you're now advocating for women and being able to hold their fears and their, their emotions after growing your capacity to hold all of that. I think that's really big. Um, how are you doing now? 
fine, thankfully. All all is all is good. <laughs> Are you in remission? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so everything's been cleared. I, it was in very, very early stage, and I'm super grateful that you know my doctor picked it up uh, super early. So I didn't need to go through any sort of radioactive therapy. Um, I didn't, you know, it was just a surgery. But of course, the idea of like even under, you know, hearing the fact that you have cancer is is just, um, yeah, it's I wouldn't wish it on anyone. Of course, no, absolutely. You know, and I think. It is so important that you're talking about that stress, trauma, fear piece and how that can be the thing that shifts the body into enough of an inflammatory state to affect or prevent a pregnancy. And I think it's also a a very sensitive topic, right? Like it's something that we need to approach with compassion because I know that we would never want a woman to hear that and be like, oh my God, my emotions are the cause of my chronic illness or, you know, it's my fault that I'm like this. And that's, that's not necessarily the case. It's kind of like this nuanced truth is in the middle kind of thing where we just have to acknowledge the impact of fear and stress on that psychological, physical axis. So it's not real. it's never your fault and it's not like your doing this to your body or you caused your illness or you caused your miscarriage, never that. It's just let's support the body on that level as well so that everything can be in harmony and you have the best chance. Exactly. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So how did you personally go about supporting yourself and increasing your nervous system capacity really to be with the the burden of what you were experiencing, the burden of that trauma? How did you go about creating more safety in your body and like, quote, healing from that time in your life to a point where you could have a healthy pregnancy? So I did a lot of energy work. Um, I also talked a lot to um, to just like friends, loved ones, practitioners. Um, and I, I was actually, when I shared my story, I was approached by so many people, um, like, you know, I, w- I was actually quite, uh, apprehensive of sharing my experience because I hadn't said anything to anyone until after my surgery was done. And once I shared that I had to go through all of this, the amount of messages that I had gotten was overwhelming of how many women were secretly going through thyroid cancer, breast cancer, and all were very, very young women. Um, I'm talking 20s, 30s. Um, So it was really having that community that helped me so much because, you know, I had some incredible people reach out to me here in Dubai who were going through stage four breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And I was just like the, the resilience of these women. And thank God they are completely cleared now, which is incredible. Um, But what they had to go through it just gave me so much strength um, and gratitude for, you know, discovering this so early. Um, But I think having that community and that support system was probably the biggest thing for me. Um, But I also had to do a lot of inner work as well, because I am someone who throughout my whole life was, um, you know, held on to a lot of emotion. I didn't express my needs, my concerns. And if you know, you know, anything about your chakras, obviously anything thyroid related is also related to your throat chakra, your, um, your conversation, um, your, you know, expressions and how you express yourself. And a lot of women who have issues with their thyroid also have issues or, um, you know, don't express their needs and their emotions as much as they need to. And so these emotions get trapped. And I truly believe, I mean, when I, even when I shared my story, I had Reiki healers reach out to me and they were like, please come see me <laughs> because we need to do some energy work on you. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that was those two things. It was just really doing a lot of inner work on like expressing myself um, much better and making sure that my needs were met which I always was the type of person that was like, again, a perfectionist who just thought that I could do it all and I should do it all. And I should be, you know, I I would be ashamed to ask for help um, because I I can do it. So, you know, it, it, um, it definitely backfired and I had to do a lot of inner work to reprogram that in my, in my brain 
Um, but also be able to share that story. I think that was the first thing that kind of like brought all of that out of me is to share such a vulnerable time of my life. And the response that I got in overwhelming love and support was just like, I think that's, that's pretty much what helped me heal. Um, and just like helped me get through that. I'm so glad that you said that because it is not, you're not like, oh, this like magical healer helped me or this super expensive trauma therapy. You're like sharing my story, putting it out there into the world, receiving social support helped me so much on a physical level that my body was able to make progress and have another healthy baby and all of these things. And that is is so powerful to me because it's so tangible and it's what we all have at our fingertips is just being vulnerable enough to share with other people and say, hey, I'm struggling or hey, I went through this or hey, this is how I'm feeling. Picking up the phone, calling people, getting those painful stories out into the world and to the people that we love the most or can lean on is something that so many of us don't do and doesn't come naturally to us and isn't taught to us. And I think especially generationally, you know, I think especially um, coming from parents or grandparents who were immigrants or part of um, kind of the old world culture where you just kind of keep everything inside somehow that that worked for them you know like somehow they're like living till they live till 105 repressing all their emotions and smoking cigs and like drinking rum bless but for our generation i think that our way is kind of the opposite we're kind of being asked to push past that and seek that support and help one another in a different and more emotionally intimate way um and it it really it means a lot to see people like you who are willing to do that after a lifetime of feeling like you couldn't lean on other people, you couldn't speak your truth, you couldn't say your needs or ask for help. And that's something I know so many women relate to. And men. And men. And I and I think in my own journey, um, that is also why I am okay at this point in my life. Because I I talk to a lot of people every week. You know, like sometimes my husband will say to me, like, how, like, how are you okay? How did you get from point A to, to wherever you are right now? And I'll say it's because I, I speak to so many people a week. I, I lean on multiple practitioners, right? I lean on a bunch of different friends, a bunch of different women in my circle from different walks of life and that I've met at different stages. And I call them up multiple times a week and I tell them how I'm feeling. I let them into the depths of my soul and I give them an honest piece of my story and what's coming up in my body that day so that I don't keep it inside. And I think if I didn't do that, I would be a wreck and I would have a lot more health issues than I do now. And when I see people in my life that are struggling, I sometimes want to shake them and be like, if you just shared a piece of this burden with other people, if you just spoke and talked about it, you you have no idea what could open up in your body. And I know that's the hardest thing to do when you don't have a history of that and haven't felt safe, but it is such a worthy way forward. And it's something that like once you start doing, you get better at. It's almost like a muscle that you have to flex. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I love and I resonate with everything that you said, I think. Um, and, and it's also very true with, women who are going through postpartum struggles in general, like that is a population that truly doesn't talk about their struggles. Um, So, you know, we see this across the board with women. I think with women, I mean, I I work predominantly with women. So I know I've seen it with 95% of my clients um, are like that. They, they don't want, there's so much resistance to share and so much resistance to get help. Um, until they reach a breaking point. And that's what I'm trying to get people, including myself, to not get to that place. Like we have to ask for help before. We have to express our needs before we get to a breaking point. Um, So yeah, I mean, that translates in every part of our lives, whether that's through illness, whether that's through postpartum, whether that's through just like daily just trying not to burn out and, you know, keep it together. 
So, um, yeah. Yeah. I love what you're saying about, um, expressing those needs before it gets bad. And I think that that's a, that's a difficult thing to do when you come from that background of, I never learned in my childhood how to assess my own needs. I don't have an awareness maybe of my own needs. Like it's kind of this emotional intelligence journey, like this, this relationship with oneself that one has to develop before they can have the awareness of, oh, I'm feeling this emotion or, oh, things are getting bad or Oop, my mental health is teetering. And that awareness kind of has to be developed first before one can even share. And then when it comes to the sharing, I also just want to say how beautiful it is that, especially in the postpartum piece, right? That if you share with someone how much you're struggling postpartum or how much you're struggling in life in general, they can't make it better for you, right? Like they, they can't come in and fix your life for you. They can't solve it. They can't really do much of anything, but just the act of saying it out loud and being witnessed is most often the only thing we need because life is hard and life is going to be hard. And being a mother is hard and postpartum is hard. And life is always going to have an element of hard and suck. And that is the reality. Yet, because we're social creatures and we're socially attuned to one another, if we just talk about the hard and also talk about the gratitude, it somehow just makes that burden easier and increases your capacity to deal with the suck because you're being witnessed through it. And that's sometimes enough. As a follow-up to that, I just want to ask, how do you suggest people who are in your shoes, right? Like, or, or were once in your shoes where you're not used to having an awareness of your needs. You're not used to speaking up and asking for what you need or even sharing how you're doing. How can people start to cultivate that awareness of what they're feeling in their own body so that they can even get to the point of sharing it with other people? That's a really good question. So, um, I mean, I'll talk about myself personally, but what I started noticing a lot was a lot of frustration. Um, a lot of irritation. I was getting snappy. I was, um, you know, and that's something that I still see today. Like when I get snappy at my kids, I know that something in my day, <laughs> I need to spend more time with myself or, you know, I didn't go move my body or I've been sitting in front of a screen all day. My needs weren't met. So that's where I start to see like, okay, take a minute, take a step back. Um, where can I, where can I express my needs or where can I get support, um, so that I don't feel this way? Physically, I would say I quite literally used to feel a lump in my throat, which is ironic because obviously I had thyroid cancer and I've had hypothyroidism since I was 16. So that physical lump in my throat is always a sign when that starts to come back. And I start to get really tense and my shoulders start to raise. Like all of these signs physically are like, okay, I need to just, you know, take a deep breath. Where, where do I, where do I need support? Um, and these are things again that get really amplified in motherhood, in postpartum, because you are challenged and tested every single day. Um, and if you don't put yourself first, you're not going to be able to show up in the best way possible for everyone else in your life, including yourself, right? So, you know, you want to be a better mother. You want to be a better version of yourself. You want to be um, the best partner, wife, woman, human in society, right? And so it starts with you. And we cannot expect every, you know, we cannot expect other people to help us if we're not going to express what we need from them. Um, so, you know, we can't expect people to be mind readers. We have to put ourselves first. We have to say what we need. Um, so those are, I, I would say those are probably the most common things that I would see physically and emotionally that would be like warning signs to, to kind of make me stop and go, okay, wait a minute. Uh, we need help here. <laughs> so you somehow had the wherewithal to connect those physical sensations to this emotional burden or this emotional need. Um, and you had this sort of like higher body wisdom that your body was giving you clues as to some emotional or psychological needs that you were not expressing and that they were connected. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. And it sounds like you just got to a breaking point of 
those symptoms of like, I can't feel like this in my body anymore. I have to express or I have to change something. And oftentimes that's what it takes for people. But I want to also ask you, did you initially come against the roadblock of feeling shame for having those needs and having those emotions? And if so, how did you push past that to finally like own them and say, it's okay for me to have these needs and express them? Maybe it was a certain degree of shame. Um, because again, I am a recovering perfectionist. So, you know, why couldn't I do all of this myself? Right. So it was just this pressure on myself to like, no, I can do it. No, I can do it. I'll do myself. No, I can do it. Um, until it just got too much and I broke down. Um, and you know, again, there, there is no shame. And I learned the hard way. And this is what I want to teach people that come into my practice and women that come into my practice is there is no shame to putting yourself first. And that is literally what I advocate every single day for women is that listen to the signs that your body is giving you, listen to the thoughts that are going through your mind, learn to have that intuition, that inner wisdom, that guiding energy that's in your body. Listen to that because we ignore that and we just push past that. And that's where we reach a breaking point. But also we need to understand that as women, there is literally no shame in asking for help. At any point in our lives, there is no shame to admitting that you cannot do it all. We were not, not expected to do it all, you know? Um, and in any point in our lives, and, and you know, especially when it comes to motherhood and pregnancy and postpartum, I mean, women gave birth in communities, in villages, in these huge, you know, families, and everyone had a role to play. We all supported each other. And now I feel like women have become so isolated and people in general have just become so isolated that it's almost like they think it's rude to ask for help. But we have to go back to, you know, we are wired for connection. And the more that we can ask for help, the better people that we are, the more that we can help each other, the better people that we become. So it's really, um, yeah, it was a sense of shame. But, you know, like I said, I learned the hard way and I, I'm really trying to teach people to not be, uh, not go through the same things that I went through, I guess. A lot of our recent ancestors, parents and grandparents, had more of a connection to a collectivist culture. And I think with the way that society and economy has changed so much and, and we've gone so far towards like this individualistic capitalist culture, which can be good, there can be a balance, but as pendulums go, we often swing too far. And I think we've gone so far into that individualistic culture of, um, I can do this all on my own and I'm responsible for me and this is mine and that's yours. Like it's, it's become a little bit of, um, of a roadblock for us versus a, a benefit. And there has to be this happy medium where we come back to a balance and sort of have, a a, a nice, a nice balance between the collectivist and the individualist and start to build those communities of support again. And I start, I'm starting to see those communities be built in many ways. Online is, is a big place, which is so wonderful. Um, a friend of mine just had a baby and she was seeing exactly what you're seeing that postpartum moms need community and need support. And they just need a place to be like, this sucks right now. I don't need you to do anything, but I just need you to see me and see that this sucks and and to be like, I feel you. And so she just created a Facebook group for moms. And already, I mean, just the, the way that that has helped to support the moms who are in this online Facebook group has been incredible to hear about. Um, and I think we just need so many more spaces like that. And we need to create a better framework for postpartum support. And it sounds like that is so much of what you're doing and what you're passionate about too. So let's talk postpartum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. So postpartum, can you just like share a little bit about, because you're mentioning this like shift in identity, this total life change, this your brain changes is something that you said earlier. Can you give us some real talk about those postpartum struggles and the true reality of motherhood and all of the feelings that come with that? Yeah, I mean... It's, I don't even know where to begin, but yes, you become, <laughs> you become, so I, I would say that postpartum and motherhood, um, you know, as I mentioned before, they truly, 
break your heart open. And it's something that you are, you are never prepared for. Like no one can prepare you for this until you are actually in it. No matter how much you speak to people, no matter how much your mother tells you or your parents tell you, nothing prepares you for just literally you've basically given birth to this human being and it's like your heart living outside of your body. Um, so the amount of emotions that go with that is insane. You know, um, you're now responsible for this human being and you could barely take care of yourself before, you know? So there's this whole like identity dynamic shift that you really have to come to terms with. And, um, there's also so much duality, you know, like we are so happy, you know, and I'll speak in with myself, you know, I was so happy to have a baby, but I felt completely foreign in my body. I felt completely lost within myself and I was unable to find myself. And, you know, you're sleep deprived. You are, your hormones are all over the place. You have the biggest hormone drop that any, that you go through at any point in your life postpartum. Um, you know, you're navigating this whole new world and all the challenges that happen with breastfeeding, which is like one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is learn to breastfeed. Um, and there's just so much like intensity postpartum and no one talks about it. Like no one, everyone thinks that it's this, this like blissful time of your life and it's all rainbows and roses, but it's honestly one of the hardest things to navigate. And this is just real talk. Um, you know, again, no one talks about this, so I'm going to be the one that puts it out there. Um, and you know, women think that it's this flex that you haven't taken care of yourself because you're a mom and you know, that, you know, struggling as a mom is like a, is the norm. And that's like, oh, you're struggling because you're a mother, but you know, no, that that's not how it's meant to happen. We shouldn't be struggling. Um, we should be getting support postpartum and, you know, all the attention goes on to the baby, but no one's paying any attention to the mother. And that's where, again, the difference between Eastern and Western postpartum traditions and cultures really come into play here. Um, but it's also like one thing that I really struggled with postpartum was I was looking for myself again and there was, you know, I was trying to find this old version of me that was just never going to come back. And it was, it's almost like a grieving process. You're, you're grieving an old part of your life, an old part of yourself, this woman that you've known your whole life and you've just completely catapulted onto the other side into this completely new person that you never even knew could exist. Um, so that is a whole thing that you need to process. It's like a grieving process and a celebration at one in one, um, because you've not just given birth to your baby, you've given birth to this new version of yourself. And it is just the most profound experience. So, um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot, uh, postpartum that you, <laughs> that we need to talk about, that we can talk about and that women go through. And it sounds like having that skill practiced of being used to sharing your struggles and your emotions and how you're feeling before having a baby, um, really would come in handy while you're going through this identity shift, because at least you can say out loud, I don't know who the heck I am. And it's really difficult. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, you know, it, it's also like, you know, that was one thing that my husband even said at the time he was like, you know, because he, it was also so new to him. He had no idea like what was going on. My hormones were all over the place. I was angry. I was sleep deprived. I had so much rage. And at one point I remember him asking me, he's like, like, what, wh what happened to you? Like, who are you? I don't even know you anymore. And it was just so eye opening because you're like, if, if my own husband doesn't recognize me, how am I supposed to recognize my, you know, how, how is anyone else supposed to recognize me? Um, I don't recognize myself, you know, so it's, we have to kind of 
And I didn't know how to express any of this. I didn't know how to ask for anything. I didn't even know what was going on with my body. You know, that is just how um, intense it is. And I, and I'm not, I don't, you know, I'm not saying that this is the, the case with everyone. I don't know if everyone kind of goes through this experience, but I know the majority of women that I speak to uh, do. And, um, you know, there's also this, this whole idea of resentment um, that I've spoken to many mothers about, you know, the idea that your husband or your partner is going about their day, um, you know, nothing's changed for them, they're going to the gym, they're eating the same food, their bodies are look the same, they feel the same, they're sleeping the same. And, you know, you are sitting there like a literally a completely different body. You don't recognize your body. You have just given birth to a human baby. Um, and just the whole act of that is like mind blowing. And you're trying to just piece the puzzle pieces together of like, what just happened, you know? And that literally was an ongoing thought in my head was like, what, what just happened? Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's also that feeling of resentment of like, well, you know, you get to do everything that you have wanted to do and have been doing. And I'm sitting here trying to like figure out this new human being that I've become and trying to navigate my hormones, trying to get my cycle back and trying to, to care for a baby that needs me and is reliant on me. So there's so many emotions at play here. And if you don't have that right support system, and if you don't have a community of women where you can express these things and and find that literally the majority of women go through the same thing, then you're going to feel very alone and it can feel very overwhelming. Um, and that's what happened in my first pregnancy. And that's why the difference between my first postpartum versus my second postpartum experiences were night and day. Um, because I made so many changes to how I wanted my postpartum journey to look like uh, the second time around. What were some of the changes that you made? Because it sounds like you're mentioning this period of like total confusion. You're, you, you mentioned this period of basically entering the unknown. You didn't even know what you were feeling. You didn't know what your identity was. And I think that that is just going to be the reality for many women. It is the reality of any transformative like rebirth period of one's life. So I imagine that this is that times a hundred and perhaps even just being prepared for that level of unknown and understanding that the lack of certainty and the feeling lost in the abyss of who am I is normal might be able to help. Um, but what other kind of changes did you make for that second postpartum period to help prepare yourself for some of those feelings or ease them? So I think one of the biggest things, one of the biggest differences was, um, so in my first postpartum experience with my daughter, within the first month, I was like, and this was before lockdown, I was like, okay, I need to get back into the swing of things. You know, I, uh, I need to go work out. I need to go run errands. I need to go get my nails done. I, you know, all these like ridiculous things because I was like, like I said, I was trying to find this version of myself that I knew before. And you're like, well, what happened to that? Um, I all of a sudden don't have time to do anything, um, let alone, you know, take a shower. But I was like forcing that I was pushing through that. I was like, here, take care of my baby. I'm going to go just head out for a few hours. And, you know, I remember I did that. My mom was here at the time and she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what, what are you doing? Like, you need to, you need to be here. But it, again, it was this like, denial. I was in denial. And I was like this, you know, this confusion was crazy. And this pressure to like, I have to get back to the swing of things. I have to go back to training and I have to go back to work and I have to go back to like seeing my friends and going out and, and all of these things was what made my postpartum, I think contributed to making my postpartum period the first time around so difficult because I had this constant pressure on myself to, you know, start doing all these things again. Um, whereas in the second time around, I completely followed like the first 40 days, not to a T, but I was like really like resting. I was eating so much better. Um, in the first postpartum period, I was barely eating one meal a day. I had just had no time. I had no idea what I was doing. I was like literally living on caffeine. Um, I was maybe eating 600 calories a day, which is like 
nothing um, for months. And honestly, like the, the, the weight that I lost, I looked sick. I looked like I was sick. Um, and I couldn't breastfeed properly. I wasn't obviously making enough milk. Um, so all of these things contributed and I made a point with myself that the second time around, I was not going to let that happen to me. And the first thing that I did was like, okay, here's how all of you people can help me, how my husband can help me, how my family is going to help me, how my, you know, uh, helper is going to help me. I have a part-time helper. You know, how are you going to help me? Um, so I made sure that my direct community knew exactly what I needed, but also I was eating better. I was nourishing my body with the most nutrient dense foods. I was prioritizing three meals a day. I was eating all kinds of things like liver meats and broths and stews. And, um, you know, my husband was making me breakfast every morning and like, there was just a synergy of all these things happening that contributed to my postpartum healing being so much better and so different than the first time around. Um, and I just gave my body time. I just, for literally 40 days, I did nothing but restorative practices, you know, um, baths, mineral baths. I was doing lymphatic drainage massages. I was doing prenatal stuff, like uh, postpartum, sorry, massages. Um, and I just took care of myself so that I could take care of my baby. Um, and it was literally night and day. I mean, it sounds like the, the biggest thing that you changed was the like kind of being direct with the people in your life and, and telling your husband. And there's a part of me that's like, well, how does your husband not know to make your breakfast in the morning or like, but at the same time, we, we can't ask people to read our minds or expect them to do exactly what we need if we're not saying it and we're not asking for it. And so there's a piece of that too, where it's like, Sometimes if you just tell your partner, this is what would really help me, then they're so happy to do it and, and so happy to help. But sometimes they feel lost and confused too of like, what would this person need right now? Or I don't see them doing it for themselves. So like it's, they're almost having to switch roles too into more of a caretaker of both you and their new child. So maybe they also need some grace and direction. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we expect these things of our partners. I mean, some guys are mind readers, which is a very rare talent. But, um, you know, I, I think it's important to, you know, and, I'll, you know, my husband was working at the time. He was obviously the one that was carrying, you know, holding the fort down for this growing family. Um, and also in the first time we were out of jobs, we, it was pandemic. So we were unable to work and that was like an added stress. So I couldn't also ask him to do that for me. So it was like a combination of things. But um, the second time around, yeah, was very different. And it really starts by one, knowing what you need, because obviously I knew now what to expect. And this is the part that like people don't know the first time around. And it's really important to kind of manage their expectations and support women that way. Um, but also I was more confident. I was like, okay, listen up people. This is what I need from you. And it was like a list of things um, because... I needed to take care of myself. Uh, I need to take care of my baby. So I need someone to take care of me. Yeah. Yeah. And you've said, um, instead of focusing on how to decorate your nursery during pregnancy, focus on having these important conversations with your partner, set in place that support system to help you. And, you know, that's an, that's an interesting thing I think about, again, going back to the more individualistic, capitalistic culture. So much of the preparation that we do for birth and having a baby is buying things is like how things look, how things uh, appear, feeling prepared with like physical things. But we forget that like the real support, you'd probably be better off if you had a community and none of those gadgets essentially. A hundred percent. And that's part of kind of what's twisted in our culture a bit. And I think, um, you know, I read the book, The Art of Gathering recently. The author talks about how to create intentional gatherings that serve the purpose um, or like the, the thesis of your event. And she talked about how one way in which she realized there was a need for this was her baby shower. 
because she realized that baby showers were so focused on showering the baby with gifts and again, material things. And it leaves the husband and the partner totally out of it, even though he also must be prepared for the expectations of having a baby. And it was so focused on like, again, this material world of these material things that it wasn't a true way to shower in the couple and prepare them as a unit for the way in which they had to change operating as a unit to accommodate the needs of baby and mom. And so she writes about in the book how looking back, if she could redo that sacred gathering, that rite of passage that's embedded into so many of our cultures and has now again been twisted to be more capitalistic, she would redo it in a way where the intention of the gathering was to bring the husband and the men into the fold and have everyone share wisdom of, hey, here's what to expect. Here's how you guys can communicate better. Here's what worked for us as a couple when we had our baby. Here's my advice to you. Or, you know, like just those, a a space instead of to shower with gifts, which can be part of it, but a space to share reality, a space to share advice, a space to prepare also the husband because he is so much a part of the system that's now going to be needed to be in place. And I just keep thinking about how, how like we've just lost the plot. <laughs> yeah, we really have. We've, we've really like missed the mark on these things. And um, we've, again, we're just focusing on the wrong things. And, you know, and I did it as well. You know, like I, I, I'm no better. Um, well, you know, no, it's just, it's about- normal because that's just yeah. like, that's just what people <laughs> exactly. do. We're like, oh, we, we're, we're already so overwhelmed. It's like, yeah, okay, we'll just organize baby shower. Thanks for organizing it. And we just do what we do. It's just, that's no one's fault. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, now looking back, I wish I had taken the time to speak to my husband more about like, you know, our financial obligations, our growing family, our, you know, the, how our values are going to shift and prior, our priority is going to shift. And how does me time look like, how are we going to continue taking care of ourselves in this dynamic shift to make our relationship stronger and better, what are our responsibilities going to look like? Um, which were all massive challenges. The first, you know, and are are still it's still a learning curve. You know, now we have two kids, um, so we I think we're focusing on the wrong things. And had we spent more time talking about that stuff, I think we would have gotten into less um, conflict in the first, you know, after the first pregnancy, because we hadn't discussed these things. And so, like I said, you know, having a child, it completely amplifies the problems that don't, haven't been addressed, or you didn't heal, you know, going into pregnancy, it transfers into motherhood, into parenthood. Um, because your child is going to trigger a lot of these things. And if you don't have that solidified foundation of like, okay, we know what this is going to look like to a certain extent, and we know what our responsibilities are going to be like, and we know what values we want to bring to the table and what values we want to maybe improve on within ourselves um, and as a couple. So all of these things are so important, um, you know, and, and I, like I said, I don't think most couples talk about any of this um, enough. I don't think most people talk about any of these things, period, in any relationship yeah. in their life, <laughs> in any, in any phase. Yeah. Like you're touching <laughs> on the core of the human struggle. I, I mean, I've read so many books from philosophers that talk about this, how they say that really the only problems, quote unquote, in life are relational problems because we are social creatures and our lives exist of relationships, right? Yeah. So when you think of any given number of problems in your life, it's it's problems with other people. That is what <laughs> yeah. the human experience consists of. So really, life is a course in relationships. And I think 100%. that that is a place where we all, it's probably what we came here to learn, right? And that's mm-hmm. a place where we can always be learning, improving, communicating more, and just figuring out how to be in relationship with other people, period, whether it's our husband, whether it's our parents, whether it's our friends. And what you're touching on here is this really interesting piece of like these unwritten contracts that exist in our relationship, these unspoken 
agreements, this unspoken status quo, these expectations that we often dance around and don't clearly communicate. Whereas if we did just speak them out loud and name the unnamed, things would be a lot easier. And so when you talk about like having these conversations of what are our values going to be going forward? I think that that is something that's a conversation a lot of people don't have before getting married, period. That's a lot of conversation. That's a lot of um, that's something that people don't talk about with friends. I have a an unrelated but related example. A friend of mine and I are going to go on a trip this summer and we're going to go kind of like road tripping around Europe, maybe like visiting my homeland in Italy. We're going to try to go off the beaten path. And originally it started off as a very like touristy Europe vacation until we sat down, took the time with each other to get clear on what are our actual intentions of this trip? What are your expectations of what you want to get out of it? What are my expectations of what I want to get out of it? How are we going to communicate with each other when we feel like we're too on top of each other and need alone time? How can we say that in a kind way to each other? And it was like so healing and nice to have that open conversation about our needs and expectations and what we really wanted so that neither of us was guessing. And then it also helped us to make the plans in the trip far more true to what we were actually desiring instead of just falling into the usual, you stay at a hotel in a touristy town and you go to a beach. Like yeah, it allowed us to have a different, or it, it will hopefully allow us to have a different experience, right? God knows. Yeah, definitely. I can screw up. <laughs> but I think that that's also something that my husband and I did before getting married, we worked with, um, a, an officiant, my therapist, instead of doing like the, the pre-wedding work of like just planning what the menu was going to be. We did pre-wedding work of like planning out or writing out like a contract of our needs in a relationship and agreeing to one another's needs and witnessing them and setting expectations. And that's something a lot of people don't do. And it was also a really hard experience because we had to acknowledge where we weren't meeting each other's needs and where we hadn't spoken up about needs before. So it just, that, that rant is just going to say that like, it's even more important. Like you said, it gets amplified during a huge life event, like having children. Having children, a hundred percent. And it's also relieving to speak about these things. Like, I'm sure that was a relief for you to, to speak to your friend and put these things in place. It's almost like you know, okay, that's, that's set, you know, and, and it's even more so with your partner, with a spouse, um, when you're having kids, you know, because all of these like undiscussed topics, they can really be a source of anxiety and stress in the individual. Um, you know, we both have fears and anxieties about parenthood, you know, whether it's him or myself. So if we're not communicating these things, beforehand and we didn't um obviously we did before our second pregnancy um but you know i wish we would have done more of that the first time around had we known that you we were literally just about to come you know come into this journey um without the right tools and without the right guidance like we did um we just had no idea what to expect i think you know, we kind of just, we were like winging it. (laughs) We're like, you know, we're just going to have a baby. It's fine. Everything's going to be fine. And Um, honestly, (laughs) sometimes that's what you got to do, especially if you have a a pregnancy that you didn't necessarily plan. Like that's, that's life. But this is kind of like the ideal scenario. Yeah. If you could be specific of like, these are the conversations I wish I had, or these are the ones that we had the second time around that changed things. I know you mentioned getting clear on like financial planning and obligations, values. Yeah. Yeah, but it, most, it was mostly like responsibilities and financial um, obligations, also like the role that we play. I mean, we're both working, obviously. So like, what does that look like? Um, you know, I can't necessarily work as much as he does uh, because obviously I'm taking care of the kids more than he does. Um, so how does that look like for my business? You know, I also want to grow a business. So like, it's a lot of communication around like my goals, my aspirations, my ambitions, Um, and where he can meet me halfway and where he can help and where we can get outside help. Um, And also, like I said, like values, priorities, where we want our kids to grow up, how we want our kids to grow up, 
Um, and our weaknesses, like we both have weaknesses. Every couple does and every individual does, right? Like where are things that we can improve um, to be better parents, to be better people, to be a better couple? Um, and that's a learning process that we're still going through. Um, but it's important to communicate these things. And I think a lot of people don't enough anyways. So um, if you have the chance to you know, you're, you're planning a pregnancy and, or you're currently pregnant, I highly encourage you to take the time to go through these difficult conversations now because they get 10 times more difficult when you have a baby to take care of and when that whole dynamic shift um, happens and you're kind of like in the middle of this transformative period and on top of that, you're still trying to decide obligations and responsibilities it just makes it so much more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's wise. And I appreciate the specific examples of like, I would like to work X amount of hours a week. And I know that you're often working th these hours. Can we agree on having help during this time? Or can we agree on, you know, eventually being okay with this kind of a daycare program as our baby gets older? Like just planning all of those things now so that no partner feels resentful that they're not able to still work if they choose or follow their dreams or, it's just clear and that that's financially budgeted for. Um, I also appreciate the example of the um, just responsibilities day to day, the where where do we want our kids to grow up? What kind of experiences do we want them to have? Like those are all such important things. Religion, like these are such yeah, yeah. big topics exactly. that we just have a baby shower and get a bottle yeah, warmer, yeah. but we're not like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, definitely. I mean, like I said, we were we were like that. So, um, you know, take it from me. Take it from someone who went through it the hard way. Yeah. Um, that and also know, try it. Try and I think it comes back to even the emotional awareness. And I'm just you know like as you're speaking, I'm seeing these pictures in my head, and I'm like seeing that this journey in preconception is about the self-knowledge, right? This journey and preconception is about understanding your own emotional landscape so that you can identify when you're teetering, when you're having a response to a built-up emotion, when something is off and can not only recognize it to yourself, but communicate it to others. And the reason that that's so important is because when you're having these conversations with your partner, you know, planning for your your new life together and planning for open, nonviolent communication, you can say, hey, I know from the soul searching that I've done the last two years that when I get resentful, I often respond in this way. When I feel taxed, overtaxed, I often start to pick fights or I start to get snappy or I get, I, I get isolated or like I, you know, isolate from you or my friends or whatever. And so I need to, that's a me thing. That's an experience that I'm having. And so I need to be able to communicate those emotions to you and say, Hey, I'm noticing that I'm isolating and I'm thinking that it's coming from this emotion. Can we, can you perhaps support me in this way? Or even just communicating that to them saying, I'm feeling resentful and seeing how they then meet you once they're prepared that that could be a possible scenario and that your emotional coping mechanism of being snappy or isolating isn't a, an attack against them. It's just your coping mechanism when you're struggling. So they can see you more yeah. as a struggling human. Exactly. And that's something that changed dynamically, you know, drastically in the second time around because, you know, I was like, I'm irritated because I've only slept three hours last night. So, you know, um, and, and they start to see that as well. I mean, it, it honestly depends on the, on the person and, and the experiences, but yeah, uh, you know, a hundred percent, I agree with everything you've just said. So, yeah, it's just, it, it's a life really is like that journey of learning how to be in relationship with other people and then also learning how to be in relationship with yourself. And the more that I'm like almost seeing like someone journaling right beforehand, those like two years before having a baby, Sometimes I feel like that's the most accessible and um, beautiful, comprehensive way to meet yourself is journaling because I want to give people some tools, right? Because 
when you are just speaking to yourself and you're just free writing and letting it all come out and kind of going through your thoughts on paper and giving yourself a a clear space in which to meet and witness yourself, it is so transformative because when else do we actually give ourselves that space? When we're just letting thoughts build up in our head, it comes up more as like anxiety or rumination. But when we put it on a paper and give ourselves like the respect almost of speaking to ourselves and spending that time with ourselves, fleshing out, here's how I'm actually feeling. Here's what's going through my mind. Here's what I actually need. Here's the answers to my own questions because I'm taking the time to ask. It is such a valuable and free tool and experience that can, that might seem disconnected. Like, oh, how is journaling going to relate to my, you know, fertility and motherhood journey? But it, it's like yeah, but that it's, foundational piece yeah. of yeah. knowing you. Of course. And I, that's actually, I'm glad you brought that up because that's actually something that I recommend for a lot of my clients is to actually not just journal, but to also, um, write letters to themselves, write letters to their bodies, write letters to their babies, write letters to um, their partners, and just express to themselves what they want to express. Um, You know, so I have a lot of women that do that. I find that practice is really healing. And so, you know, it brings them so much clarity, and they start to recognize you know, where sort of the shortcomings are of, you know, things that they need to work on or um, things that, you know, they need to express or things that they need to communicate more on. um, Because a lot of the women that come into my practice, you know, have all kinds of um, fears and anxieties and, you know, unhealthy relationships with their bodies. So that exercise can be really healing. And I'm, so I'm glad that you brought journaling up because yeah, a lot of people think like, oh, well, it's journaling, but it actually is, um, a very helpful exercise. And that was something that I remember I did, uh, after my thyroid surgery, I actually wrote a letter to myself, um, with just like gratitude of, like the strength that I had to go through this and that it's okay, that it's not my fault, that it's not my body failing me, that it's, um, you know, a sign of something greater that I need to communicate, that I need to go through, um, that it's like pushing me into a new dimension of myself. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a very, very helpful exercise to use. So I, I'm a huge fan of it. I love that. I mean, I also, we talked about, you talked about the throat chakra earlier and I'm always like, it's funny. I'm always trying to toe that line of, I'm a very woo woo person, right? (laughs) I'm very woo woo, (laughs) but I'm always trying to toe the line of making sure that I grounded in science. And I, you know, I mentioned like, yeah, well, communicating and being social has been shown to lower your inflammatory cytokines so that people who are maybe skeptical or turned off by the woo stuff, don't feel like we're going off the deep end. But at my core, I have deep reverence and respect for ancient Ayurvedic medicine and the chakras. And the same way that a a repeatable double blind controlled placebo study is kind of like verified and, and tested through different methods. I believe that ancient medicine systems like traditional Chinese medicine or ancient Ayurvedic medicine that have been around for thousands and thousands of years are also essentially studies in their own right and time tested in their own right. And so there is something to that chakra system. There is something to that lens of how they viewed the body um, and the patterns in which they noticed and the way in which they were able to identify chakras the same way that science is able to identify inflammatory cytokines. It's just two different lenses. And so when you talked about that throat chakra earlier and how that was sort of your lens and the way that you were able to approach it and really have realizations, I think that's so valid and so powerful. And from what I know of the chakras, um, the throat is related to the pelvis and sort of like the root and the sacral and our sense of safety. So no wonder, right, communicating our needs helps us feel safer, helps us at that root pelvic area, helps us with fertility, like that whole thing. But also I just, the reason I'm going off on this tangent is because when we talk about journaling, right, some of us aren't the best at expressing our feelings verbally, right? Some of us aren't the best at expressing it directly through the throat, right? That's not our preferred method. We don't, we don't feel comfortable (laughs) when we're put on the spot, but sometimes 
we feel comfortable writing and taking writing. time yeah. to journal. And that still, even if it's journaling, that still has an effect on the throat chakra because it's a form of expression. 100%. Yeah, definitely. And it was something, like I said, I felt complete relief when I, when I did that. So, you know, it's something that I, uh, I highly recommend for women to do and a lot of the times in my practice. Yeah. So. And sometimes it's like, you know, we, we might not always know, we might not always have a sense of like clarity of what we even want, right? When we're thinking about these conversations with our partner and thinking about being clear around our needs and our desires and our values, right? Sometimes if you even just write out a prayer, like to whoever you want to pray to, whether it's God or the universe or whatever, sometimes as you start writing your prayer, your true desires just come out on the paper and you get to know your needs better through that, you know? Or like you said, when you're writing a letter to your partner, and even if you never send it to them, it helps you be clearer around what you need from them. What and, you, it, what it, you need. Yeah. and it can also help you forgive them privately within yourself for the resentments that build up in relationships when you write that out on paper. Definitely. Definitely. And that's what I see with a lot of, like I said, with a lot of my clients who aren't able to express themselves verbally. Um, that's why it's such a, and that was me. <laughs> so I completely relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's so powerful. And I think if you don't take the time to meet yourself in ways like that, it's hard for other people to be able other to people. meet you mm -hmm. or meet yeah. your needs. And, and it's just, again, such like a free and beautiful tool. And I love that you also included writing a letter to your body in that. Mm -hmm. I have a practitioner who has me um, speak to my organs sometimes, um, you know, speak to my liver if I'm angry. And sometimes I'll, I'll write a letter to my organs. And even that is so powerful. And it takes the pressure away from like, oh, I need to journal. Because there's, there's like a, a little barrier of entry there. It can feel weird. Weird. It can yeah. feel <laughs> embarrassing, vulnerable. It can feel, I don't know what to write. I'm not a writer, right? Yeah, yeah. And it can feel hard to just be like, dear diary. But if you go into it with a prompt, right, with like a letter to the body, a letter of like gratitude for my body, right? You go into it with something specific and you just let yourself write with no pressure. You're amazed at what comes out. Yeah, definitely. Now that we've gotten into a little bit more of the, the fun woo and the spirit and the relationship aspect of fertility, which I didn't even expect us to go there as much as we did, but yeah. I'm so glad that we did. <laughs> I want to circle back to what you said about the first 40 days, because that is more of like a physical, traditional way to support the body. And yep. we've talked to guests on the pod before about the traditional Chinese medicine version of the first 40 days. Um, and it's very much about keeping warm in the Chinese culture. It's very much about like ginger sponge baths and covering your kidneys and staying away from wind. I'd love to ask you about in, in Middle Eastern culture, what does that entail and what was kind of like your version of the quarantine or the first 40 days culturally? So they're very similar. Um, you know, it's custom in the Middle East, again, similarly uh, to, to the Asian cultures to rest for 40 days. So I think in some cultures, obviously, it's like quarantine. So you literally don't leave the house a lot of cultures sometimes they, they don't even shower um so so some in some cultures i think it's a little bit more um intense in terms of what they do um in the middle east it's similar in terms of you know the rest not seeing any guests not having anyone come over the house um and that's because obviously you know the woman both the mother and the baby are in a very vulnerable place. Um, you know, they're healing, the mother is healing. Um, you don't want to obviously catch any illness. You don't want to expose yourself to anything. But it's also like your body is has just gone through this trauma, essentially. So we want to make sure that you are healing and you're giving your body that space and that rest and that warmth and, you know, just waiting for sort of the bleeding to, to subside. And, you know, if you had a C-section, obviously that's different. Um, but you just want everything to kind of, uh, um, feel a little bit better and, uh, and heal physically. So, um, it is very much a sacred time and it's really essentially for the mother to slow down. Um, it's to bond with her baby. So very similarly, you know, that's what we prioritize. 
um, and giving the mother ample time to recover. Um, so rest is sort of the name of the game. Again, to just kind of in a world where the modern day woman is like, I have to get back to it or, you know, they're rushed prematurely to, to get back to work. They're rushed prematurely to get back to, they think they need to get back to like moving their bodies and losing weight and healing faster and bouncing back and all of these things that are like this modern day trends or thoughts around postpartum healing has actually made the postpartum period a lot more difficult. So we're starting to see this shift into this, the more Eastern traditions. Um, and I've seen that, you know, even in places like New York now, they have like postpartum centers where women are doing retreats and they're, you know, staying for weeks, months at a time to kind of give themselves that space and that support system that you need that traditional Eastern cultures prioritize and have been doing for years and years and years. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing. I think maybe the difference is some things in our nutrition and our diet, obviously, um, because we have different foods and ingredients and things like that. But essentially, the idea of it is the same. It, it sure is. It sounds very similar. And that's something I'm always amazed and delighted by is the fact that, again, thousands of years ago, these different corners of the world, whether it was you know, ancient Mayan medicine, which is in modern day Latin America, or it was traditional Chinese medicine, or it was the Middle East. Somehow everyone got the same download. Everyone got the same message. Everyone observed the same things from the human body and said, Hey, there's, there's a certain set of things that we got to do. This woman's body has just been massively opened. Women are this portal, right? So we are completely opened in order to give life. And as that woman is now conserving energy and, and closing once again, which takes time. We need to make sure that cold and wind and other like pernicious forces in Chinese medicine, for example, from the environment don't invade the surfaces that are so vulnerable after just being opened. And that's, to me, that makes so much sense. It's why you wear a hat in the winter when it's cold outside because there's this, you know, point on the top of your head where wind and cold can invade or the back of the neck, you wear a scarf. There's certain openings of the body that cultures have recognized. And so the, the Middle Eastern wisdom sounds very similar to Mayan medicine and Chinese medicine. And, um, what you're saying about the centers in New York, it's kind of like, I guess that's a good capitalistic solve to individualistic yeah. culture. Yeah. It's like we're replacing what the family we're, would have done, yeah. I mean, but we're creating we're spaces. There, I guess <laughs> I'll take it. Okay, we're getting there. Yeah. I'll take it. Yeah, I, I think mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's great. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing a lot more like postpartum um, accounts on social media, even like postpartum nannies, postpartum doulas, um, where they specific, you know, postpartum chefs, postpartum meal companies. So that's great. I mean, Yes, it's capitalistic, but we're moving in the right direction. Um, and that, I think that's what counts. Um, at least we're creating those know. spaces. I think that's the exactly. best, that's the that's best the use of capitalism, important. right? Like exactly. <laughs> using it to create exactly. community and experiences. Yeah. That is what it was probably intended for or the best use of yeah. it. You know, I'm not, but also the, you know, the acknowledgement that this, these practices have merit. You know, we, the modern day woman, we just cannot look at postpartum the way we've been looking at it over the last few decades, it's just not doing us any favors as women. And we need to kind of go back to these traditional cultures uh, because it makes a world of a difference in how you heal and how you can show up for your baby and how, you know, your body responds to what it's just gone through. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I saw a huge difference just by applying that in my own personal experience. And I know that you said that the foods are obviously different, but I know we have a lot of Middle Eastern listeners who would love to know some of these like cultural, specifically indicated foods for nourishing the body in the first 40 days. Yeah. So again, lots of warm foods. Um, we have a lot of like vegetable stews that we make. Um, like one of the things that I you know, my mom made a lot for me was like okra stew, which is um, very uh, Egyptian. Um, lots of soups, lots of broths, um, you know, chicken and vegetable soup is, is a big one. Um, like broth, just drinking broth regularly. All of the, Obviously, all that collagen and that gelatin really helps with healing. Um, you know, a lot of like oats and things like that to help um, with milk supply. So lots of warm cooked oatmeal. 
um, you know, spices, things like fenugreek, so fenugreek tea, caraway tea, um, cumin seeds and cumin tea, you know, all of these fennel tea, these are all amazing for, again, milk supply, um, hydration, obviously, I think a lot across all cultures, that's super important. Um, but also we have uh, a lot of liver meats in our diet. So a lot of um, cooked liver, liver pat, I mean, you can have liver pate, we cook our liver uh, with different spices. And that, I mean, postpartum is probably one of the most amazing, not only nutrient-dense foods in general for women and your hormone health and fertility, but for postpartum specifically. It's literally like taking a multivitamin. Um, so having that a few times a week was amazing for me. I mean, I saw a huge difference just by doing that. Um, and then we have more traditional things. So like in Egypt, for example, we have a drink called Murat, which is uh, a drink that is made from fenugreek powder um, and like other spices. So again, things like caraway, cinnamon, turmeric, and I think also ginger. Um, and it's to increase breast milk, but it's also a celebratory drink. So like when people come over to celebrate the birth of your new baby, it's something that we offer them. Um, similarly in the Levantine region. So, you know, if you're from Lebanon, Syria, um, they have something called mughli, which is similar, a similar idea, but it's a rice pudding made from rice flour. Um, you know, it's got maple syrup. It's got, again, the same spices, caraway, um, fenugreek, anise seeds, and I'm sorry, not uh, fenugreek, anise seeds, cinnamon, um, and some coconut nuts and things like that. So that is also to help increase breast milk. And it's a celebratory um, offering that we give to guests when they come over. So those are some of the things that maybe uh, are more obviously Arabic in tradition. Um, but I think in general, it's the same premise, warm, healing, nurture, nourishing, nurturing foods. Um, and yeah, honestly, it makes a huge difference. Like I was eating salads my, <laughs> my first postpartum period, which was like when I think about it now, but it's it's honestly because of just lack of time and planning. And, you know, I didn't um, I didn't plan properly. I didn't have an appetite. Uh, I was just like lost, really. Um, yeah, I didn't have an appetite. I was and, and that's actually something that I speak to a lot of women about. And they're like, I can barely eat one meal a day because I just cannot even look at food, um, which is not a good thing. So we really want to make sure that we plan these things in advance if you don't have family near you or a community or a helper or whatever it is that can help make these foods not only in advance, but also while you're while you're healing and while you're in that postpartum period. Um, so it's very important because we don't want to be eating one meal a day. <laughs> no, the appetite thing makes so much sense. We just talked about the body being so open and vulnerable to, you know, different like imbalances that can come in when, when something is vulnerable, cold and wind are not the only imbalances that can come in when you're open and weakened and vulnerable, but dampness in Chinese medicine is something that can come in when you're especially weak. Right. And so when you have dampness in your digestive system, which was, it is very much normal when you're going through stressful periods of life, pregnancy, birth, all these things, you don't have an appetite and you can't transform food very well. And so it's, so um suit like it's so suitable what i'm hearing from you in these drinks and medicinal medicinal herbal dishes and elixirs that all of these carminative warming damp clearing aromatic herbs like fennel seeds and anise are essentially helping to warm up the digestive fire transform the dampness and stoke the fire of your appetite because again the, these cultures for years and years observed these patterns and i'm sure saw hey, what happens when a woman gives birth is she gets damp and has no appetite. We got to warm her and rebuild her and get that appetite up so she can make new healthy fluids is what they would call it from food so that they can digest again. And so this is like the insurance that comes from culture and tradition. And we got to listen to that. And as you're talking, I'm like, oh my gosh, the liver, like how can we get people to eat more liver? I was almost thinking like, I wish the government would send every woman like weekly liver meatballs instead of sending them like, <laughs> you know, as like part of their health insurance. Yeah. And then I'm like, Honestly, wait, yeah. culture was the original government assistance. Like this yeah, is, exactly. we got to get back to it. Yeah. 
Yeah, we do. And and I think we, we're starting to notice that, like the Western world is starting to see the, the merit and the validity of Eastern cultures and, you know, the importance of a warm womb, you know, and warm healing foods and not doing ice plunges if you're trying to get pregnant, you know, the, the, I mean, all of these kinds of things, like we could go on and on and on about the difference between Western de- trends and cultures and Eastern cultures. And we need to go back to that wisdom because it's been done for thousands of years and we have not changed biologically. So, you know, we have to listen because it's tested and true. And um, we've, again, we've veered so far away from that, that we just, we need to come back. And there's a balance. Like how lucky is it that we get to use these traditional practices and then also give birth in hospitals and also have the medical care to have better birth outcomes and we get to combine them. It's not one or the other. It's not screw Western medicine, only Easter. It's like, it's like, how do we just get back to some balance and respect yeah. both sides? And it's like, I am, I'm hoping to be the balance bringer. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I mean, balance, like we have to, and we are lucky to have that, um, those options. We are really lucky. So, you know, we just have to be a little bit more, a little bit better in the decision making process and also understand that it's this all or nothing approach to our health, to our wellness, to our healing, to our fertility, to our postpartum. It's never all or nothing. It's what works for you. And, you know, what works for you is not the same that's going to work for me. But we have all of these pieces that we can take from and, you know, be able to build our own plan that works for us and, and supports us and nourishes us. And, at the end feels good to us because how many women are doing things that just, you ask them like, are you actually enjoying doing this, what you're doing? And they're like, no, I hate my life because I'm eliminating 500 foods or, you know, I'm on this diet or that diet, or, you know, I'm doing this trend or whatever it is. Right. So it's, um, yeah, I think it's important to, to kind of be uh to have that inner wisdom and to also listen to how your body reacts to things whether it's preconception postpartum overall healing wellness whatever it is in your journey um that's what we need to keep coming back to i love the way that you closed this by coming back to a little bit of the diet culture piece and a little bit of the like hey let's prioritize feeling good above looking good or western standards period right like above the salads and the smoothies and the green juices and the low calorie diets like all of this is going back to not only tradition right what we just said about the cultural foods and practices but also like the fact that those cultural foods are more nourishing and more nutrient and calorie dense and won't get you back to a size zero within four weeks of giving birth and the fact that that's okay and that's needed. And it's also getting ourselves out of this mindset, like you just said, of like the Western diet culture as well and the undernourishing and the I have to do this because I have to do this versus I want to do this because it feels good, even if it's not giving me this rigid outcome that I think I need. Um, and that's really wise and we're, we're wrapping up. So we didn't get a chance to like fully go into the diet culture piece, but I think that that sentiment really kind of encompasses it and is beautiful. And maybe on a follow up, we can talk about like unwinding the diet culture programming around fertility. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's a huge piece. And I think the, the, you know, like you said, that sentiment really wraps everything up, but, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway I want women to have from this episode is to really come back to yourself like listen to your body and i think that is what we are forgetting to do um and if you build this relationship with your body and this inner wisdom that you have and that intuition it will give you so much guidance that you will know what to do for yourself in the best way possible. And that is something that I have cultivated over years and years and years and years of trial and error. I had no one guiding me in any of this. You know, I've done it all. I've done every diet. I've done every trend. I've been through the ringer with so many things when it comes to health and wellness from a very young age. And 
the one thing that it taught me was to create this awareness with my body and to truly cultivate self-love and appreciation for how, just how amazing our bodies are as women and how powerful it is to be able to, for our bodies to do what they do, right? You know, whether or not that's what you want in life, whether or not you want children, but the fact that we are programmed that way is just so miraculous. And we have to nurture that because whether you want children or not, your fertility matters, your hormone health matters. Um, and if you want ongoing overall health, you have to couple that awareness, that body love, that self-love, that self-awareness um, with the nourishment and the nurture uh, in all ways mental, emotional, food-wise, whatever it is. Um, and that's truly, I think, the key to overall health and fertility for women. And I like that you said it, it takes time and you've been through the ringer and it, it was a journey for you because it doesn't happen overnight that you just wake up and you're like, I don't care about being thin anymore. Diet culture is just <laughs> done. It's that over time you learn my body is so miserable when I go against it. What if I just tried listening? And over time you slow down and you cultivate that relationship with yourself. You journal, you do whatever it is. You put your hand on your heart and you say, what do I, what does my body want to eat right now? What would feel really good and nourishing in my body? And you just start to practice listening to that and you just test it out. And over time you build the trust back and it's, it's a lifelong journey for all of us and always will be because body image in society gets in the way of so much, but it is like so beautiful to hear that your mission is to keep bringing women back to who they really are and what their bodies are really asking for. Yeah. Definitely. As a way forward through fertility. So, so incredible. Okay. <laughs> wow. Thank you for such a heartfelt conversation today. Thank um, you. You, your, your spirit and your soul and your compassion for women just really shines through. And I'm sure Thank that our you. listeners would love to know where they can find you and how they can work with you. Yeah, definitely. So the easiest way to reach me is on Instagram, which is at Sandra Sharp Wellness and Sharp is with an E. Um, and, you know, just message me. Let me know if, uh, if you came from this podcast or you listened to this podcast, I'd love to hear your feedback and, um, there's a lot of resources on my page, so please have a look through. And um, I've got free resources. I've got programs you can jump into. So whatever feels the best for you. And we'll link some of your um, top resources in the show yeah. notes as well, just so that women have places that they can go. And we'll link your website and all of that. For sure. Incredible. Thank you, Thank you so for your much. time today, Sandra. You're the best. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was lovely to chat. <laughs> Wasn't that great?